Um, we're now into the seventh year of operations and our knowledge and understanding and impact is growing from strength to strength year on year. Each year, the launch of our annual assessments, a big milestone, highlighting not just the nature of modern slavery in the UK, but also the unwavering dedication and hard work of the helpline team here at Unseen. Before we get into the agenda proper, I'm just going to. Uh, I'm just going to run through some housekeeping. Sorry, I thought somebody had mentioned something there. Um, firstly, if you hear an alarm, uh, run. Don't wait for us because it's your house that's on fire, not ours. Um, so please uh, just bear with me. I'm just getting the screen together. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Fabulous. Great, OK, so just to run through some housekeeping. Um, so due to the large number of participants, um, we are asking if people can please keep their microphones and cameras switched off during the presentation. Please do raise any questions or comments in the chat function. We hopefully will have an opportunity at the end of the presentation to take any questions that you may have. Um, so it'd be great if you could put them in the chat function and we will pick them up from there. Uh, this event is being recorded and copies of the recording will be available on request. We will also send a link to the annual assessment and presentation to all attendees and invitees later this week. So you will receive that um, individually yourselves. So just moving on to the agenda, um, I'm really delighted that we've got a number of speakers. Um, I will be providing a high level overview of the data for 2022 and um, all of that um, uh, information related to the helpline. Um, then you'll hear from Natasha Mitra, who is our head of helpline services, and she will take you through all the different typologies, the demographics for potential victims, etc. So really some kind of detailed information about the different types of modern slavery that we see in the UK. We'll then hear from our guest speaker, Ella Cobain from UCL, um, on helpline data and how that supports research and, and academic projects. I'll then come back and talk a little bit about challenges and opportunities and the emerging trends that we've seen through 2022. And then I'm really delighted that we will hear from one of our helpline advisors, Toby, who will give his perspective on working within the helpline and his view from the helpline. As I said, hopefully we'll then have five or 10 minutes for questions and answers. So please do continue to put those questions in the chat function and we will um, answer them as we go. So first off, high level overview of 2022. So just as a reminder in terms of the Modern Slavery and Exploitation Helpline, um, we have been running for uh, over seven years now, really delighted that we are continuing to maintain really high quality services for those individuals that call and contact us. We remain a 24 seven operation, 365 days a year. Um, we provide translation services and we have fully trained specialist staff, which I think is is really important and um, focused on making sure that we provide the right level of knowledge and information to those who need help, support, information and guidance. So thinking about our data model, well, our data model is dynamic and flexible and it allows us to amend the model over time, reflecting growing trends. It's also extremely complex, recognising the various complexities of the different types of modern slavery and, in fact, other interrelated crimes. We don't just receive information related to modern slavery crimes, but also labour abuse, as well as other interrelated crimes like domestic abuse, kidnapping, child neglect. As I said, Natasha will come on to a lot of that granular information um, in a moment. We capture different elements of uh, data, case level information related to calls and contacts. 
individual level information related to the demographics of those individuals involved in situations that includes potential victims as well as potential exploiters. Task level activities, because it's not just about answering a telephone call and you'll hear from Toby later on in terms of the complexity of the role that's undertaken by those who are uh, working on the helpline and um, referrals and signposts. So making sure that when we have individuals who want help or access to information or advice, um, if we have um, that number of different uh, options in terms of making referrals, whether that's to the national referral mechanism for government support um, and, uh, and help, or whether that's to another NGO who may be on the ground in a local area, a local authority or a police force, that's really, really critical. Um, what I would say is that we always are on the side of caution, so conservative assessment and reporting is critical. We don't want to over inflate or in fact conflate um, figures. We know that there is often an issue with understanding immigration, uh, smuggling versus trafficking. So we're always making sure that we assess every element of information that's coming into the helpline so that we can um, really provide a conservative figure in terms of the types of information and the types of calls and cases that we receive. Now, just to give you a bit of a high level overview in terms of 2022, we had 6,516 potential victims indicated in situations we deemed to be modern slavery. So that's taking a view of the types of situations reported, the information that is given as part of um, that call or contact, and then estimating based on um, the indicators whether or not that situation is deemed to be modern slavery. That's a 116% increase on the figures from 2021. We had 9,779 uh, calls, web forms and app submissions received by the helpline. So that's a huge number and that's the, the largest we've received um, for, throughout the whole time that we've been in operation since 2016. 4,231 potential exploiters indicated across a whole range of different types of modern slavery. So again, these numbers are pretty significant. 8,387 referrals and signposts made by the helpline to other organisations and agencies. And that's right across the whole spectrum of work that the helpline does. So that will include uh, signposts and referrals for situations that may not be deemed to be modern slavery. They might be labour abuse, but they might also be for wider help and support, for example, to domestic abuse charities in a local area or to national charities charities that can help and support um, in relation to other issues. Um, 2,588 cases of modern slavery were raised by the helpline, so that was off the back of all of the calls and contacts that we received, and that again is a significant number that's increased quite significantly, and I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. Um, at least 99 different nationalities of potential victims indicated. And again, we always err on the side of caution, making sure that where we have different nationalities, we're not making assumptions about the information that we receive from those who are making those calls and contacts. So if they are really not sure of the nationality, we will put unknown. In terms of helpline calls, um, you can see on the screen now um, that we've had a 16% increase in the number of calls across the year for 2022. Um, staggeringly, a 63% increase in calls from potential victims themselves, which again is significant. Um, in many other similar situations in other helplines across um, the world, um, the number of potential victims who contact themselves is often quite low. Um, so we're always very, very 
keen to hear from potential victims themselves. If somebody's in direct contact with a potential victim, we will try and establish whether we can um, engage with the potential victim themselves directly. Um, and the importance of that is um, because we can then corroborate elements of the story. It's not from a third party. Um, so 65% of all calls from a potential victim or someone in direct contact with potential victim um, is important for us. And as you can see across the year, um, we had a, um, a steady um, amount of calls and contacts peaking um, in July with 708 calls. So when we think about other forms of contacts, uh, web forms are fairly significant and we've seen a year on year increase in terms of web forms throughout the lifetime of the helpline. An 8% increase in web forms from 2021 to 2022, um, peaking in October at 353, which is significantly higher than the rest of the um, months in 2022. Now we could um, assume that that was maybe as a consequence of all of the activity that happened around anti-slavery day um, but we're never really quite sure we, we we do think that that probably has had an impact there's a lot more information and um, and education and awareness raising happening around um, October so it's always great to see that um, our efforts in terms of raising awareness have an impact and then in terms of app submissions, now we've seen a significant increase in app submissions in 2022. I've just provided the 2022 numbers, partly because the numbers have been um, fairly low in previous years. We did have a significant spike in June. Um, we have been working with other organisations like the Cluer Initiative, so we are linked into the Safe Car Wash app now. Um, and we do think that lots of those um, contacts through the app um, in June were made because of that um, collaboration and that partnership working. So you can see we had a 224% increase in app submissions from 50 in 2021 to 162 in 2022. And we expect that that will continue throughout this year, but we are um, maintaining a watching brief. So just moving um, in terms of potential victim demographics. So this is across the whole range of different types of modern slavery that we see in the helpline. And um, so you can see there in terms of age status, the majority of individuals that we deal with or that we um, indicate through the calls and contacts that we receive are adults, 2,885. We have 331 minor potential victims indicated, um, but we did have 3,300 where there was an unknown age status. Now, again, that's because if somebody can't confirm whether or not um, somebody is an adult or a minor, then we won't make assumptions. We will always err on the side of caution. Again, in terms of gender, uh, you can see the breakdown there. We had a very, very even split in terms of females and males, 1,922 females versus 1,953 1, um, male potential victims. Um, Natasha will come on to how that breaks down across the different typologies. We did have three trans gender potential victims indicated. These were two female transgender and one male transgender. And as I've said previously, um, a number of unknowns, 2,638. Um, quite often the unknown gender and the unknown age status may be because we're talking to uh, frontline professionals, health professionals, maybe the police who might not provide us with the level of granular detail that we can capture. Nevertheless, we can always provide um, information that they might need in order to help and support a particular individual in a situation. Just moving on to the top 10 potential victim nationalities. So you can see there, um, there is a difference between 2021 and 2022. However, Romania has remained the uh, most prevalent nationality that we've had um, for a number of years now. So um, it is very interesting to see that that continues to be the case. 
What is more interesting is that we have seen a number of nationalities changing and quite significant increases. So in the in relation to Indian nationals, we've seen an increase of 536 percent. Thailand, an increase of 533 um, percent. And there are nationality differences in the different types of modern slavery, which Natasha will come on to um, in a moment. And um, what is also interesting and what we've changed for this year is that um, we've actually recorded those who are um, uh, deeming themselves to be a UK national rather than broken down into England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We are still recording those who tell us that their nationality is English or Scottish, Welsh or Northern Irish. Um, but where we have somebody indicating that they're a UK national, then we are also recording that as well. So when you look at uh, UK nationals, sometimes we have more granular information related to those who are in the particular UK countries. In terms of top 10 potential exploiter nationalities, again, I think this is interesting. We've seen a number of changes um, across the years. Um, the most prevalent nationality in 2022 um, is with Chinese nationals. Um, if you look at the numbers for um, England alone, 57 different nationalities of potential exploiters being reported in situations involving uh, cases related to England. Um, the, pro the most prevalent nationality for Wales and UK cases or cases deemed to be within the UK where we couldn't establish whether that was in one of the four UK countries uh, remains Albania. Um, and when adding all UK cases together, so that's those who are deemed to be UK as well as England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, UK is the fourth most prevalent nationality. So again, really interesting. We see Russia, uh, the 10th most prevalent um, popping in um, into 2022 and we hadn't seen that in the top 10 um, in previous years. So again, it's a, a moving um, situation and a moving picture, but one when we look at over a number of years is interesting in terms of the way in which potential exploiter nationalities are being indicated. So just off the back of that, we deal with lots of calls and contacts um, from individuals whose first language is not English. It's absolutely vital that we can provide interpretation. So in 2022, 1,346 interpreter calls. That's a 17% increase on 2021. As I said, it's absolutely vital that we can provide the help and support to those who need it and whose first language is not English. Um, 41 different languages were used on helpline calls. And as you can see, the most prevalent languages um, are on your screen. There are some notable changes. So Arabic has been our most prevalent uh, language on translator or interpreter calls and that's down from 272 to 230. Vietnamese down from 128 calls to 32 but Albania up from 80 to 145 and Russian up from 14 to 38. And interestingly, for the first time, Ukrainian was used in a number of calls in 19 calls in 2022, but no calls in 2021. And so really important to see potentially how the uh, conflict in the in the Ukraine um, has had an impact in terms of the number and types of calls that we will be um, getting throughout the helpline, not just in 2022, but moving into 2023 as well. In terms of international calls and cases, although the helpline is UK based, we do still receive calls and contacts from outside of the UK and calls and contacts that are related to issues and situations that are occurring in other parts of the world. So we've had a rise from 193 cases of modern slavery to 323 involving that international dimension. Modern slavery cases have been raised relating to 74 different countries across the globe and that's outside of those in um, the UK. Most contacts that we receive um, in terms of calls are from the USA, 
followed by India and Pakistan. And again, you can see uh, some information there on your screen in terms of the types of modern slavery international cases. So most prevalent is labour uh, with 166 cases, followed by sexual exploitation with 58. But as you can see, we see all different types of uh, cases being raised as part of, of the work that we do, not just in the UK, but overseas as well. And then just moving on to the comparison of the total number of modern slavery cases by UK country, which again, I think is interesting. And we always try and provide this um, to provide information, advice and guidance to um, our counterparts in the four UK countries. I think it's interesting to have this breakdown um, and there is more information that is included as part of the um, publication. So please do see that once you have access to the link. So in the UK country, Countries, we've seen an increase right across the piece, um, both um, from a, a number of uh, cases, but also the number of um, potential victims that are, in, are indicated there. So most significantly, an increase of 108% from Wales, 89% from England, 84 from Scotland and 73% from Northern Ireland. And you'll see the bottom line there where we've indicated 102 cases in 2022, where we knew that the, um, uh, the the situation was involving somewhere within the UK, but we couldn't say with any um, uh, with any certainty that that was England, Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. So again, uh, 102 cases where the um, the location was in the UK. And then just finally, in terms of referrals on cases, we've had a 52% increase in referrals that have been made by the helpline. And obviously this is referrals related to the wide number of different um, types of cases that we will raise as part of our work. But in addition to the referrals, we made uh, 6,180 signposts. So that's uh, providing help and information and advice to those who call and contact us about other support mechanisms, other support organisations, whether that's on a local, regional or national basis. You can see from the graph that the Metropolitan Police Service had the most referrals from the helpline, closely followed by the GLAA. Um, and I think it's really important when you look at this to see the breadth of the work that the helpline uh, undertakes and the number of different partners organisations, agencies that the helpline works with to really get us to, to where we need to get to. So that's just giving you um, a bit of a, a high level overview of the statistics for 2022. I'm now going to hand over to Natasha Mitra, our head of helpline services, who will take you through a more granular approach to the 2022 data. Thanks, Tash. Thanks, Justine. So I'm going to give you a closer look into each of the exploitation types. So for the third consecutive year, we've seen an increase in sexual exploitation cases. So averaging around 40 new cases per month. Um, sexual exploitation cases comprised 19% of all the modern slavery cases recorded by the helpline in 2022, making it the second most common exploitation type that we saw. The number of sexual exploitation cases increased from 289 in 2021 to 479 in 2022, which was a 66% increase. Um, and that corresponds to a 50% increase in the number of potential victims, of which 834 were recorded. So 39% of cases were raised by someone um, in direct contact with a potential victim. So often that's a sex buyer. Um, so if we combine that with the 19% where potential victims contacted us directly, that's almost 60% um, from someone directly involved or close to the situation. Um, so the vast majority of potential victims continue to be female. So that was 85% were female. Um, however, we did see the number of male victims more than triple um, from six to 20. Uh, although that only accounted for 2% of sexual exploitation potential victims. 
10% of the potential victims were minors, uh, which is almost twice as many as the previous year, um, a jump from 37 to 82. Um, when we look at nationalities of potential victims, uh, historically Romanian has been the most common nationality indicated in sexual exploitation cases. Um, however, in 2022, Thai potential victims became the most prevalent, which was an astounding increase of 880% on the previous year. Uh, Romanians were still second, followed by Chinese, Albanian and Brazilian nationals. Um, we also looked at potential exploiter nationalities. Um, so the top five there were Chinese, Romanian, Albanian, English and Iranian. The most common locations of exploitation were consistent with the previous year, with 41% um, in private houses and 23% where exploitation was taking place online. So labour exploitation is the most common type of exploitation that we see, um, and those cases make up 40% of all the modern slavery cases indicated to the helpline in 2022. So we saw 3,882 potential victims of labour exploitation indicated, uh, and that was an increase of 162%. So that's possibly due to coming out the other side of the pandemic, making the workforce more visible um, and increasing the need for recruitment. So that related to 1046 cases, which was uh, an increase of 134%. Um, looking at gender here, 34% of potential victims were reportedly male. So that was 1,323 males. Uh, and that was more than twice the number of females um, indicated in labour exploitation. So the 588 females indicated. Uh, 108 of the potential minors were indicated as minors, uh, which is approximately twice as many as the previous year. Um, if we're looking at who contacted us on these types of cases, members of the community reported 36% of labour exploitation cases, so 466. Um, so often they've that's somebody who's attended a business or they've used a service uh, and then they've reported situations that they've found concerning to the helpline. Um, so we look at what sectors this is um, occurring in. So the service industry was the most common sector reported with 247 cases. So that was a 225% increase. So this sector includes two very high risk sub industries, which is car washes and beauty spas. So beauty spas includes nail bars. Um, so there are a total of 160 cases relating to car washes and 70 related to beauty spas. We saw a lot of exploitation taking place in car washes. So that was 553 potential victims indicated there. Um, so as Justine mentioned, we've been working collaboratively with the CLEAR initiative around safe car wash app submissions, which could explain the sizable increase um, in car wash cases that we've seen. So following the service industry, the second most prevalent industry was the care sector, uh, where we saw a dramatic 606% increase from only 15 cases indicated in 2021 to 106 cases in 2022. So that equates to 708 potential victims. Um, so in the care sector, we were seeing a lot of people, a lot of potential victims trafficked from India, Zimbabwe and Nigeria. Um, so the 219 Indian potential victims recorded in labour exploitation make up 84% of all Indian potential victims indicated to the helpline in 2022. So in 2021, Construction was the industry where we saw the most potential victims indicated. Um, and in 2022, whilst cases in construction increased by 35%, labour exploitation was so prolific in car washes and the care sector that they've both overtaken construction. Um, so within situations of labour exploitation, it stands to reason that the most common recruitment tactic was through a job offer or advertisement. Um, smuggling and ransom, uh, followed by false promises, were the second and third most prevalent recruitment tactics. And the most commonly reported control method was financial control, which was reported in relation to more than half of the potential victims. Uh, and that was that was closely followed by tied accommodation. So 
where someone's living on site or in accommodation arranged by the exploiter. Uh, and then confinement or restricted movement was third. So this is a comparison of the top 10 potential victim nationalities in 2021 and 2022 for labour exploitation. So 71 different potential victim nationalities were indicated in, in relation to labour exploitation uh, and 99 nationalities if we look at all modern slavery cases. So here India was top on the list for labour exploitation, um, almost exclusively in the care sector. So 526% more Indian nationals indicated than in 2021. Uh, Romanian, Romanians featured most heavily in the service industry, particularly car washes, um, but also in construction. Vietnamese nationals were most prevalent in the service industry, notably beauty spas, a lot of nail bars. Um, Chinese nationals continue to feature across a range of industries. Zimbabweans were again mainly in the care sector, uh, with only two recorded the previous year. Um, no Nepalese potential victims were indicated in 2021, but in 2022 uh, it was the sixth most common potential victim nationality, um, and that was most commonly within uh, manufacturing. The number of Sudanese potential victims was consistent with the previous year, so we see a lot of Sudanese nationals um, often exploited for agricultural labour in Libyan camps. Uh, Ukrainian potential victims were indicated for the first time, um, likely due to uh, increased vulnerability as a result of the conflict and displacement. Um, and we did see several cases um, that were reported that referenced the Homes for Ukraine scheme. Nigerian potential victims also indicated in the top 10 for the first time in labour exploitation, um, again predominantly in the care sector. And UK nationals were indicated um, across the board in a range of sectors. Um, so we did also look at potential exploiter nationalities. Um, so there were 58 different nationalities indicated um, in labour exploitation. The most common being Libyan nationals. So as I mentioned, that often uh, relates to Sudanese potential victims. Um, after Libya, the top five exploiter nationalities were individuals from Vietnam, the UK, Romania and India. So next we're going to take a look at criminal exploitation cases, uh, which comprise 9% of all the modern slavery cases indicated to the helpline in 2022. So we saw a 16% increase in criminal exploitation cases since the previous year, with 226 cases indicated, uh, relating to 317 potential victims. Um, gender comes into play here, with twice as many potential victims indicated as male than female. But if we drill down, um, we see that with cases relating to drugs, 79% of potential victims were reportedly male. Um, and that's in contrast to forced begging cases um, where potential victims were predominantly female. So 58% were female. 10% of potential victims were reported to be minors, and that was a 5% decrease from the previous year. Um, if we look at nationalities of potential victims, there were a lot of unknowns, um, but the most commonly reported was Albanian, so that was 34 potential victims. And that was followed by Romanian, 17, Vietnamese, 13, English, 8 and Georgian, 8. The top two exploiter nationalities matched the top two victim nationalities, so Albanian and Romanian. Um, and the most common potential exploiter nationality um, by a long way was Albanian. So almost six times as many Albanian potential exploiters were indicated than Romanians. So 34 Albanian to six Romanian. <coughs> um, so more than two thirds of cases related to drugs activity. So that's 153 cases. Um, so those include county line situations, as well as cannabis cultivation. Um, there were also 38 cases of forced begging indicated um, and also a small number of cases involving forced shoplifting. So the top three locations of exploitation that were indicated, which were all very close in numbers, were cannabis farms uh, in 44 cases, the street in 41 cases and private houses in 40 cases. 
so in terms of how potential victims were recruited, um, there, again, there were a lot of unknowns, but the most commonly reported um, was through the exploit of befriending them. Uh, false promises were also common, um, as was coercion. The most common method of control was confinement or restricted movement, and that was indicated in relation to 146 potential victims. So that makes sense if you're thinking about potential victims locked inside cannabis farms or the controlled movement of county lines victims. So following on from that, financial control was the second most common, um, indicated 112 times, um, and then threats to harm the potential victim or somebody close to them or associated with them, and that was indicated 89 times. Domestic servitude cases made up 4% of all modern slavery cases raised by the helpline in 2022. So that we saw a 75% increase to 114 cases of domestic servitude, and that related to a 45% increase in potential victims. So 142 potential victims were indicated in situations of domestic servitude. Females, again, continue to be indicated more than males in domestic servitude, um, comprising nearly three quarters, uh, and that's an 8% increase than on the previous year. 6% of, of potential victims were minors, uh, which again is consistent with last year, with 2021. Um, three quarters of domestic servitude potential victims were reported to be adults, uh, and the remainder were unknown. Again, we looked at potential victim nationalities, of which 31 were indicated. Uh, Filipinos were potential, the most prevalent potential victim nationality in 2021, um, and they continued to be highly indicated in 2022. However, um, they were just surpassed by Nigerians. Um, so there were more than twice as many Nigerian potential victims indicated in 2022 than there were in 2021. Uh, interestingly, the most commonly indicated potential exploiter nationality was also Nigerian. Um, however, no Filipino exploiters were reported. Um, so similarly to labour exploitation, job offers were the most reported recruitment method in domestic servitude cases, um, indicated 27 times. Many potential victims were also recruited through family members, so that was indicated 19 times. False promises, 18 times. Smuggling and ransom, 18 or through an intimate partner or marriage proposition, 14. So once in a situation, the most common control method reported was tied accommodation, which was indicated 93 times. And that was closely followed by confinement or restricted movement, which was indicated 90 times. So domestic servitude is usually taking place within a household. So those two were likely much more common than was reported. Um, and financial control uh, was also highly reported, as were both emotional and physical abuse. So we'll take a closer look at child victims now. So 8% of all modern slavery cases raised by the helpline indicated potential victims under the age of 18. Um, so that was 213 cases involving 313 potential victims which equates to 5% of all potential victims indicated to the helpline in 2022. And that's actually a 71% increase from the 194 that were indicated in 2021. In terms of gender, um, so the breakdown of minor potential victims, we had identical numbers of uh, males and females indicated, so 97 each. Um, in 137 instances, the gender of the potential victim was unknown. Um, but when we look at the gender breakdown of minors in specific exploitation types, there are some um, quite significant differences. So in labour exploitation of minors, there were three times as many males indicated than females, so 45 to 14. Um, in sexual exploitation, females were seven times more prevalent than males, 49 to 7. Males were nearly four times more common than females in criminal exploitation, so 23 to 7. And in cases of domestic servitude, no males were indicated. However, three females and five unknown minors were. 
If we look at the breakdown of minor potential victims by exploitation type, the most common was labour exploitation, where 33% of minors were indicated, so 108 total. Um, so labour was the most common the previous year as well, but in 2022, more than twice the number of potential victims were indicated in labour exploitation. Um, a quarter of minor potential victims were sexually exploited, so 82 individuals. Um, which is more than twice the number reported in 2021. 10% of potential victims were exploited criminally, so that was 32 individuals, and that's a drop from the previous year where 21% of minor potential victims were indicated in criminal exploitation. 2% of minor potential victims were involved in domestic servitude, so that's five individuals, and that's quite consistent with the previous year. So within labour exploitation, the service industry was where the majority of minor potential victims were exploited. So that was 48 minors. Um, so that's considerably more than in any other industry. So it's more than three times more than the second most indicated industry, which was hospitality, where 15 potential victims were indicated. When looking at all modern slavery cases, the most common age bracket indicated was 16 to 17 year olds. Um, so that was 22% of minors reported were in that age bracket. Um, this was the most common age range for minors in labour exploitation. 13 to 15 year olds were only slightly less represented, so 21%, um, so 69 individuals. Um, and interestingly, that was the most indicated age bracket for minors in sexual exploitation, criminal exploitation and domestic servitude. Um, so the nationality of almost three quarters of minor potential victims was recorded as unknown. However, Romanian continued to be the most commonly reported nationality, and that was indicated 13 times. Um, Vietnamese was second, Pakistani third, Indian fourth and Polish fifth. Um, interestingly, Polish nationals didn't feature in the top 10 nationalities for adult potential victims. Um, and there was a higher representation of minor Pakistani nationals than adults. When we look at how these minors were recruited into exploitation, there were a lot of unknowns, um, but the most commonly reported recruitment method was through a familial relationship, uh, which was indicated 19 times. And the most commonly indicated control method was sexual abuse, which was indicated a total of 69 times. So due to the high number of labour abuse cases that are indicated to the helpline, um, we in 2022 we started um, recording these cases in more detail. Um, so whilst we observed a significant increase in labour exploitation in 2022, we also saw a 42% reduction in labour abuse cases. So 464 cases were raised involving 1,767 potential victims. So if we look at the gender breakdown, um, gender was unknown in, in relation to more than half of the potential victims. However, males were more than twice as prevalent as female victims, comprising 29%. In terms of age, this was again unknown in, in relation to roughly half of the potential victims, um, but only 1.6% were reported to be minors. The most commonly indicated nationality of potential victims was Indian, so that's much the same as in labour exploitation, um, comprising 41% of potential victims of labour abuse, so that was 200, 229 individuals. Um, Ukrainians were the second most indicated, making up 10%, uh, which was more than four times fewer than Indian nationals. Romanian, Russian and Bulgarian potential victims completed the top five nationalities reported. So in terms of indicators of labour abuse, the most commonly reported was non-payment of national minimum wage, and that was reported in relation to 42% of, of potential victims, so 736 individuals. Um, other common indicators were inadequate PPE, um, so that was in relation to 29% of potential victims. Long or excessive hours, 27%. And harassment, intimidation and bullying uh, in relation to 26% of potential victims. 
So similarly to labour exploitation, the service industry was where we saw the majority of labour abuse cases um, and potential victims. So 120 cases um, and 419 potential victims. Other highly represented industries were janitorial and cleaning services um, with 245 potential victims, agriculture and farming, 203, hospitality, 199, the care sector, 161, construction, 132, and manufacturing, 109 potential victims. Um, so each year we provide a breakdown of modern slavery cases by police force region um, and that's included in the annex at the end of the annual assessment document. So that provides details per police force region on the number of cases and potential victims indicated overall um, and then broken down by exploitation type. Um, there's also a breakdown of gender and age of potential victims as well as details of the number of referrals submitted to other organisations. Um, and we've also provided a comparison between 2021 and 2022. So please do have a look at that. It can be quite illuminating. Um, so that document will be published on the website and we'll also send a copy out by email to all of you following today's event. Um, thank you very much. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand you over now to Dr Ella Cobain, who is an associate professor at UCL's Department of Security and Crime Science. Ella specialises in human trafficking and exploitation and is going to speak to you about the value of the helplines data set to academic research. Thank you so much and thanks for having me to talk today. Um, yeah, so I've been working in this field for over 10 years now um, with all sorts of different organisations and I'm broadly interested in rigorous applied research that can help improve understanding of trafficking and exploitation and support more effective and more ethical responses. And I'm here today because together with my colleague uh, Lisa Thompson, we've been working on an analysis of helpline data. And that's part of a bigger project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, in which we're looking at the complex social, geospatial and temporal systems involved in trafficking. So today I'm going to draw on our first analysis of helpline data, which is based on over three and a half thousand cases which were reported in its first two, two and a half years of operation. So a bit older than the data you're seeing today. And we're now also working on follow up research, which will look at changes over the COVID period in particular. And we were really glad that Unseen agreed to support our research and to provide access to their data in fully anonymised form. And that's part of a bigger picture of Unseen facilitating other academic research. So I know, for example, they're working with academics at Leicester University around adult services websites. And it's really great to see an organisation like this opening up to these research collaborations because the help plan is such an important part of the anti-trafficking landscape in the UK. And there's also considerable value in its data, as well as obviously the support services it provides. Um, some of you might be surprised to learn that actually across the world, there's virtually nothing in the way of academic research into anti-trafficking helplines. And that's particularly surprising because these helplines are an increasingly important part of anti-trafficking strategy internationally. So there's fairly well established helplines in places like Poland and the US, and then there's newer ones in places as diverse as Ukraine, Mexico, Canada, South Africa, Angola and beyond. And what you get is different helplines follow different models. So some of them are state run or state affiliated. Others are run by NGOs or transnational uh, governmental organisations. And in our view, there's particular value in those like Unseen's, which are operated and funded independently of the state. And what we know from research on helplines in general, so not anti-trafficking helplines specifically, is that they can be a really important part of responses to all sorts of complex issues, be it mental health, problem gambling, eating disorders, child abuse and neglect and so on. And generally speaking, helplines follow a public health model. So even when they address criminalised issues, they tend to prioritise prevention, harm reduction or pathways to support. 
So today I'm going to briefly talk through four reasons why it's so important to understand more about how anti-trafficking helplines specifically are used in practice. And I'll draw there on the findings from our research with Unseen. So the first is that helplines can provide much needed support to marginalised, stigmatised and or criminalised populations. So with a helpline like this, the key target is obviously people who have themselves been exploited. And we found that they made up a significant minority of cases. But what was striking was that the rates were actually much higher for some types of exploitation than others. So, for example, domestic servitude, it was markedly higher. And that's traditionally been much more neglected in anti-trafficking responses in the UK. Compared, though, with many non-trafficking related helplines, the Modern Slavery and Exploitation helpline actually has quite a broad and varied audience. So we found that overall and for all exploitation types except labour, um, the most of the cases, the most common source of cases was people getting in touch based on direct contact with someone potentially being exploited. And that can cover a whole range of personal and professional relationships. We also looked at what onwards action was being taken by the helpline, and that really underscores the whole system's response to supporting people who get in touch. So you see a huge range of different signposts and referrals. Uh, which really spoke to a concern for helping meet people's varied and often quite complex material needs. And oftentimes in anti-trafficking, there's very much a focus on sort of anti-trafficking organisations. But actually here we see things like housing and legal support being incredibly important as well. And it's vital that such services are also properly funded. Uh, the second point is that anti-trafficking helplines offer valuable independent data, which allows for complementary insights into what you'd get from official data alone. So, for example, the NRM in the UK. And in kind of looking across these different data sets, you can help build a more nuanced picture. It's worth stressing that all of these data sets are kind of the product of messy, complex interactions between trafficking activity and anti-trafficking activity. So none of them are a sort of perfect mirror of what's going on, and they're all likely subject to various different kind of skews and biases. We found some quite pronounced differences between helpline data and NRM contacts for the same period. For example, uh, many fewer helpline cases involving suspected sexual exploitation or, as you might expect for a UK based helpline, the proportion of cases where the reported exploitation was in the UK was much higher than what you get with the NRM. And overall, the helpline data really emphasised the kind of the scale and the variety of instances reported as potential trafficking and exploitation. And you will have noticed that Justine and Natasha are both saying potential throughout. And this qualifier is really, really important because the activity reported may or may not have been experienced as modern slavery or meet legal thresholds for it. Um, and, you know, the helpline is not intended to sort of be there as an arbiter of whether it crosses those thresholds. It's meant to be victim centred. Um, but we need to sort of recognise and understand that uncertainty in there. So overall, we found both a lot of diversity in helpline cases and some quite concentrated um, clustering, be it geographically, demographically or by sectors and subsectors. And we found statistically significant differences between key uh, potential exploitation types, which again really highlights the importance of more nuanced and disaggregated approaches rather than kind of one size fits all. The third point is that helpline data offers valuable insights into how the public understands trafficking and the possible effects of messaging on this topic. So both trafficking and even more so modern slavery have notorious um, what's known as fuzzy boundary problems. So it's very difficult to draw the lines and to define and recognise and operationalise these terms consistently here. And there's risks here, not just for helplines, but for anti-trafficking responses in general, that uh, there can be profiling on racialised, gendered or classed lines, for example. 
And what we saw when we looked at the labour exploitation cases in particular is that they were very much driven by uh, two particular concerns that had dominated public discourse, namely car washes and beauty. And that indicates a clear influence of public messaging on shaping understandings of what's considered modern slavery. We also found that a really sizable chunk of cases, uh, but particularly so for labour exploitation, came from public reporting of what they saw as suspicious activity. Uh, and that raises important questions about the use, the risks and the benefits of what's known as spotting the signs. Another thing that was really striking is how different the cases um, identified through the UK helpline are compared with anti-trafficking hotline cases in the US, for example. So there, the vast majority of helpline contacts relate to suspected sexual exploitation of US children. So you see much more broad and varied picture over here. The fourth point is that engaging with helpline data and helpline staff, because these are really complex data sets um, and complex processes involved, provides really important insights into how helplines address victimisation and what challenges they face. So the helpline has multiple roles, clearly. So it is a crisis helpline and it supports people in dire need, but it's not exclusively that. It supports some people directly with their own exploitation and also serves lots of other people who are in direct or indirect contact with them. And then finally, it also acts as a sort of Crime Stoppers style tip line for the concerned public. And what there is at the moment is a missing feedback loop in general, which isn't the helpline's fault. It's a function of the systems it operates in. But it means that uh, agencies receiving onward referrals do not routinely report back on what happened as a result. And again, that's another reason it's so hard to establish you know, what potential exploitation was subsequently you know, classified as such. Um, and the helpline has many very important safeguards around consent. At the same time, like many NGOs, it also operates in a broader systemic environment that raises certain tensions. So we see particular challenges here around onwards referrals to the police based on members of the public spotting the signs where the individual consent of those people affected can't be established. And we recognise that these issues are really, really challenging for helpline staff, because on the one hand, not acting on concerns raised could enable further harm. And on the other hand, there are also risks that involve the authorities. And here it's really important to recognise that law enforcement itself can pose risks to people who've been trafficked and exploited, or indeed to people who are wrongly profiled as such. And that's especially true for people with ir irregular migration status, because the police may share data onwards with immigration enforcement or involve them in kind of welfare checks or raids. And there's also risks more broadly to people involved in criminalised activity like sex work or drug sales. So like other people have argued, we think there's a real desperate need for a protective firewall in place to stop the police from sharing um, personal data on victims and witnesses of crimes with immigration enforcement. And we think there's a need for an end to the involvement of immigration enforcement in anti-trafficking policing activity. But unfortunately, the government continues to reject such measures like the call for a firewall. In the meantime, I think many of you probably share my concerns about the way the UK is moving and the kind of increasingly hostile environment around immigration and the ongoing rollback of anti-trafficking rights and protections. Within this context, it seems likely that the helpline is going to become an increasingly important alternative to the UK authorities. So it's going to be ever more important to ensure that the people it seeks to support are maximally protected from the risk of state hostility. Um, so finally, kind of what are some future directions for research in this space? The first is we think it would be really useful to explore in detail how helplines, not just in the UK, but internationally, are perceived by different audiences. So questions around awareness and trust and willingness to contact and so forth. And that could really inform responses. We also think there's a clear need for rigorous evaluation research particularly from the perspectives of target audiences and service users with lived experience of exploitation.
And we think it's also really important to understand more about the immediate and the longer term outcomes of helpline contacts, including both benefits and any unintended consequences. And all this type of research and more would really help build a stronger evidence base to inform future helpline strategy and activity. So thank you very much. That's it from me. Fabulous. Thank you, Ella. Um, really appreciate that input. I think, um, you know, highlights the importance of partnership working across the piece, but also um, the increased work that the helpline and also our policy and research function here at Unseen um, is supporting on with the wider academic audience. So I'm just going to now touch on challenges, opportunities and emerging trends. I know there are a number of uh, questions that are in the chat. We will pick those up. I am really keen to get to hear from our helpline advisor. So I'm going to scoot through the challenges, opportunities and emerging trends. We can then hear from Toby and then I'm hoping we'll have some time to answer the questions in the chat function. If we don't get to all of them, we will answer and provide that as part of the pack of information and materials that we'll send out post this event. So just in terms of thinking about challenges, opportunities and emerging trends, in terms of challenges, one of the uh, challenges that we're facing at the moment is very much around referral pathways. We, like many others, have resource implications in terms of the work that we do. And we actually work with a huge number of different audiences and different organisations and agencies. That includes the policing uh, family right across the UK, uh, with Border Force, the Gang Masters and Labour Abuse Authority, many, many um, local authorities across the UK, as well as other areas such as the National Crime Agency. Um, part of the work that we do is making sure that we can pass information on to those who need it and who can act on it. Uh, some of the organisations that we have historically referred to are now um, either not accepting the referrals that we ordinarily would send um, or are starting to, to push those referrals back. Um, this is a concern for the helpline because we clearly have made assessments, trained specialist staff have made assessments on whether they think uh, the information that they've received requires further um, further action or whether it requires further input from others who are better placed to undertake an investigation, for example. We are working with a number of different organisations like the Care Quality Commission around the care sector, with HMRC around national minimum wage issues, health and safety executive. We're trying to establish referral routes with all of those organisations so that we can provide an overview, if not case level information of what's happening in their sectors. I think this is absolutely critical. We need to make sure that we can get this information to the individuals and organisations that have the ability to make the changes that we need to avoid others from becoming embroiled in exploitative situations. So that's an ongoing piece of work um, that we're taking forward. I think the other challenge and has been alluded to by Ella is very much around the UK government's approach to migrants and immigration. Um, I'm sure many of you on the call will know that we have very, very grave concerns around the illegal immigration bill that's making its way through Parliament at the moment. We think it's extremely detrimental to individuals who are um, identified or indicated as potential victims of modern slavery and closing down of routes for access to help and support for those individuals who may clandestinely come to the UK. Um, it will create a real underbelly within society and will prevent people from coming forward. We believe at the helpline that that might increase the number of calls and contacts we get from these individuals who are extremely vulnerable, but will have no recourse to public funds, no recourse to support through the national referral mechanism or through other mechanisms 
mechanisms that may be available through local support networks. Um, and that's really concerning for us. So we will be keeping a very close watching brief on that as we move through the rest of this year and into 2024. And I think the challenge with data generally, so we have data silos across the piece, we have policing with data, we have the national referral mechanism with data, we have ourselves as well as many others within the sector. And I think what we need to do is work out how we can utilise that data to maximum effect to make sure that we can look at how we can um, use that data to prevent people from getting exploited in the first place, to learn more about how we can apply that back into our business clients, to um, statutory agencies, to those who have um, the, uh, a, a role in supporting vulnerable individuals, particularly where there are those key touch points. So we are looking at how we can work more collaboratively, more systemically at um, increasing that data capability. Um, and part of the work that I will come on to in a moment around opportunities in terms of our policy and research potential. So in terms of opportunities, Natasha has mentioned around how we are changing the way we record labour abuse cases. I think this is really vital because when you think about the spectrum from poor working practice to labour abuse and then tipping into modern slavery, so forced labour situations, it's really important that we know and understand that trajectory and that we can report on the number of uh, potential victims that we re receive into the helpline, um, the different types of sectors that are in, involved in those situations and really providing some uh, kind of narrative on what we're seeing. So that is very crucial for us and we will continue to build and grow our knowledge and understanding of labour abuse cases and that how that interplays with um, significant issues of forced labour. I think other opportunities providing wider helpline and business services. So really thinking about how we can not only utilise the data that we have from the helpline, but also the helpline services, given that we do have 24 seven capability. We have um, lots of different security measures to ensure that we're dealing with not only information, but individuals in a very secure, confidential environment and that we build and grow that trust. But we also work with many businesses across a wide range of different sectors. We have a business helpline portal that provides situational information to businesses about the types of um, experiences and um, situations that are being reported to the helpline and that really helps us to build that growing understanding knowledge of what's happening on the ground and being able to then leverage that through systemic change through changing behaviors um, both within the corporate world but also within statutory agencies and policing as well. And then finally, in terms of policy and research potential, um, for about 18 months now, we've had the capability of um, really looking and focusing and directing our attention around policy and research. We've got very good links into the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Centre, as well as links across the UK governments. And this is really helping us to build that evidence base that we need and working with organisations like UCL, like the Nottingham Rights Lab, like Cardiff University, Leicester University. We've got many um, opportunities to work with academic partners and also other partners to really uh, leverage our policy and research capability. So that's um, a real opportunity for us moving forward. And it's one that we are utilising, particularly as we've recently set up our, our survivor consultant forum. So we have a number of survivors who are supporting and contributing their experiences, knowledge and understanding on how we can improve not only our services, but how we can improve research into this area. And then just finally, in terms of emerging trends, and we've talked about a number of these issues as we've moved through the presentations this morning. So really thinking about the care sector where we've seen cases from Indian, Zimbabwean and Nigerian nationals, and we want to do a, a further piece of ad hoc work around the care sector, looking at what that means and how people are getting into those situations. So we'll hopefully be able to do that later this year. 
Um, looking really around Thai victims being the most prevalent nationality and sexual exploitation on what's moved there. I noticed in the chat that we had, um, uh, you know, a uh, a question about the Romanian nationals. And I think what's really interesting is that we do see a different cohort of individuals being indicated to the helpline, um, as opposed to what we see through the national referral mechanism, as opposed to what we see through the policing um, element as well. And I think that's really interesting because I think the helpline is getting more and more interaction with those individuals that are in very precarious situations, don't want to engage with the authorities, want to have a trusting and confidential um, conversation with somebody on the helpline um, and knowing that that information won't go any further um, unless they're indicating a, a life or death situation or if they're indicating minors in a in a precarious situation. So that's really important for us. We are monitoring the nationalities and we are hoping to do some more um, work around uh, situations that are, are becoming most prevalent across the um, information that we have on the helpline. Um, I think the other two emerging trends are in financial exploitation. I think that remains prevalent right across the piece, but also in situations where it appears that uh, modern slavery typologies, the typical modern slavery typologies that we have talked about this morning, aren't necessarily prevalent. So we're not necessarily seeing somebody being financially exploited in forced labour or sexual exploitation, but actually are just being financially exploited um, in terms of their bank account being withheld or their bank card being withheld and they're actually having to pay money to somebody else that's not necessarily related to where they're working and so again that's an area that we're starting to record separately we think this is really important and it's an area that has um, not had that much um, oversight of in recent years but it was one of the first we were one of the first organizations to talk about financial exploitation back in 2018 as a unique entity and I think in terms of organ harvesting, obviously, this is something that we've seen in places like um, Africa, in West Africa. But actually, we had our first organ harvesting case proper in the UK um, in 2022 through the helpline. I know there have been um, recent reports of an organ harvesting case that went to court um, that, that the helpline wasn't involved with. But I think, again, this is interesting. We have had situations where organ harvesting has been raised as part of other exploitation, the potential for organ harvesting to occur. But I think the fact that we've had our first proper case and we've also had a subsequent case in 2023, again, is something that we want to keep an eye on. So they're the emerging trends that we're seeing through the data. And without further ado, I want to now hand over to Toby, who's one of our helpline advisors. Um, it's all well and good us talking about data um, and what that means, but actually hearing from somebody who works on the helpline um, and who can give that assessment of what they are seeing from their own perspective I think is absolutely vital so really delighted that Toby is here with us and Toby over to you. Thank you yeah hi um, as Justine Martin. said um, as, ju somebody trying to sleep in our garden. Uh, as Justine said my name's Toby and I'm a helpline advisor on the modern slavery and exploitation helpline and I've been working for the helpline since October. And from day one at the helpline, we are told that our aim in our job is to put ourselves out of business and to strive for a world where there is no need for a modern slavery helpline. And that is a passion that all helpline advisors share. To become an advisor, we go through over 150 hours of intensive training. In that training, we learn all about modern slavery legislation from um, uh, modern slavery from indicators of modern slavery to the vulnerabilities for modern slavery, uh, the legislation, business legislation and support systems available for survivors of modern slavery. And we also receive a lot of training around how to make assessments for modern slavery and the indicators to look out for. Uh, we also receive training on call handling, such as how to provide trauma informed support, emotional support, establish safety plans and take challenging calls. And also being aware of the impact on us as helpline advisors of listening to these traumatic accounts and the possibility of secondary trauma. 
uh, and there are some extensive support systems that Unseen has in place if we are struggling, such as debriefs after calls, monthly supervisions and group external supervisions, internal wellbeing champions and general emotional advice and counselling available through an employee assistee programme. And we cover a wide variety of other topics topics including adjacent crimes such as labour abuse what it means to be survivor centered and so 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 much data training and even after the initial four weeks we get continual development training on areas like drafting and sending referrals data cleaning and refresher sessions to ensure our subject matter knowledge is up to date once we've completed the four weeks, we go online and we start to take calls and experience what it's like to be an advisor. So at 8 a.m. the first advisor signs in and then there are shifts all the way through the day until 10.30 p.m. And overnight we have sleep shifts, so there is always someone online if someone needs to call. Uh, during the day when we're not on calls, we log emails, web forms and app submissions. And these contacts come from a variety of different people. We get contacts from professionals like lawyers, doctors, police officers and local authority staff who are looking uh, for technical assistance on cases they think could be modern slavery. And then we also get calls from members of the public who think that they have seen indicators of modern slavery. And so we do assessments with them and then we refer on to the relevant organisations as appropriate. Uh, we also receive calls from businesses needing advice on how to tackle issues in their supply chains uh, who we can put in contact with Unseen's business service team. And then we get calls from survivors of modern slavery and we advocate for them. Advocating for survivors of modern slavery is one of our most important roles. Uh, we take a survivor centred approach, meaning that where possible, we make uh, them aware of all available options so they can make informed decisions about how they would like to proceed. Often we need to advocate on behalf of survivors for them to access support or to be extracted from situations or that situations are investigated. And on an almost daily basis, this involves for advocating for survivors to be entered into the government funded support system, which we mentioned briefly um, throughout called the National Referral Mechanism or the NRM. And that can provide counselling, accommodation, financial support and so much more. Um, although, as mentioned, it can be quite challenging for advisors because we personally don't hear much back from the police after discussing these difficult situations with survivors. And we will talk to individuals for as long as needed uh, to try and make sure that they're safe during and following our calls. Uh, some calls do take longer than others, particularly those where we connect an interpreter so that a survivor can speak to us in their preferred language. And then as well as taking these incoming calls and emails, we are always busy. Uh, we have a shared task list that we work through. We make follow up calls and emails to people after their original contact. And then we draft and send referrals to law enforcement officers, modern slavery charities and local authorities. And then a lot of the work that we do is around data, which is the reason that we're all here today. After every single thing we do, we record data and then we have tasks to update and correct that data if there are mistakes, as well as certain advisors go through and check the data on every single case. All of our cases are reviewed by a senior member of staff and the data on each case is cleaned so that we can be confident that we have uh, reliable data and that all our callers are being provided with the best support possible. And while survivors might not always find data the most fun part of the job, especially after doing it for a few hours on end, is actually um, a really important thing that we all know is um, is exciting because we know that the data that we record influences how the UK responds to modern slavery. And so it is exciting to be part of that change. And for me, being part of the helpline is part of taking a stand on the front line against modern slavery. Call by call and case by case, we are seeing lives change. We are seeing survivors access support services so that they can flourish after their experiences. Uh, we're seeing survivors not being put into prison for crimes that they were forced to do. And most excitingly, we're seeing those still in modern slavery being brought to safety. Uh, and, and one of these cases um, that I remember was an extraction that I um, had to facilitate during a sleep shift, uh, which I'm just going to share now. So just after Christmas, we received an anonymous web form which had indicators of mon slavery at care agency. It was reported that this care agency was forcing individuals to work long hours and they would only receive £300 per month. Uh, the individuals in the situation were being bullied and they were threatened to be deported if they refused to work. The web form also stated that the employees stayed in tied accommodation, which was arranged by their employers. This was logged by one of my colleagues and they set a task for a referral to be drafted and sent to the police. 
as we work off a shared task list, I drafted the referral and after it was reviewed by a manager, I sent it off to the police. Uh, I was then on a sleep shift a few weeks later and just after 5 a.m. I received a call from a man who wanted to anonymously report his situation. He revealed that he'd come from abroad to work for a care agency and he had had to pay £10,000 for his visa. He and many other individuals worked up to 18 hours a day, sometimes 10 days in a row, and they would only receive between £300 and £600 per month. They would be verbally abused by their manager and they were afraid of reporting their situation as they were told that they would be deported if they did. During the assessment, I asked the name of the company and I instantly recognised it as the one that I had drafted the referral for a few weeks ago. And the reason that he had called at 5 a.m. was because he had no food that day and he wanted to call when no one else was awake so that as he was scared that the managers would find out if he was doing it when they were awake. He called us because he didn't want to give his details to the police in case it got him into trouble with the exploiters. He said that others were terrified of the managers and they were scared to report their situation. And he revealed that he'd made the previous report to us and he'd also reported the situation to other organisations and that the manager had discovered that he had spoken up. And so he was now fearful for his safety and the safety of his family overseas. And so he recalled us to request help to leave the situation. On this call, um, I assessed him on slavery and I explained the referrals that we can make and provided him with information as to where he could get emergency food in his area. Uh, and then following th this assessment, I called my supervisor to ensure that the best next steps were taken and then called him back to explain that we could do a 101 call to the police and try and facilitate an extraction. After discussing what a 101 call to the police would entail and what would happen so that he was fully aware of the next steps, with his consent, I then called 101 to explain the situation and arrange an extraction. And later that day, a written referral was also sent to the police. As I said, from day one at Working for Unseen, we're told that our aim is to put ourselves out of business where there is no need for our job and working on the help that I truly believe. And we have started to see that we really can end slavery in our lifetime. And that is why I love working for this organisation. Uh, I think we're now going back to Justine. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Toby. And um, I've just seen a, a comment in the chat which I fully support. Um, you know, the importance of the job that Toby and all of the helpline team do, um, you know, is absolutely crucial to, to all of the work on the helpline. Um, and, you know, this is just one small snapshot of, um, you know, uh, an understanding of what the helpline does. Um, so thank you very much for that. Really do um, appreciate that, Toby. Great. We've got a few minutes and we do have uh, a few questions in the um, chat that we're going to try and kind of whiz through for you. Um, so I just noticed that there were a couple around first responder organisations um, and I just wanted to kind of make the point that Unseen is a first responder organisation. However, when we set the helpline up, we were very clear that um, from the helpline's perspective, it's not possible for us to act as a first responder, partly because that would mean that we would be a national first responder for anybody and every everybody, um, and partly because there is a responsibility for local authorities, policing um, and others to actually undertake this duty. As most people know, um, being a first responder is not a paid um a paid for service and therefore with a very small but perfectly formed team it's very difficult to um to agree to do that so we are not first responders on the helpline what we do is we provide um, advice and guidance to individuals if they want to be linked to a first responder we will find a first responder in their local area that can have a face-to-face -face, hopefully engagement with that individual to get the facts I think this is even more critical given the changes to the national referral mechanism and the changes to the reasonable grounds decision and the requirement for objective evidence it's just not something that the helpline is um, is set up to provide on a national basis um, and if you think about the the helpline team, you know, is comprised of um, of 15 people. It's actually um, uh, and 24 seven. It's really difficult for us to do that. So I just wanted to to kind of put that out there. And um, in terms of other um, questions, 
Um, is there any indication into what makes victims feel comfortable with reporting in themselves, um, recognising that MSHT is so hidden and difficult to find? That's from Jenny. Um, Tash, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so um, the, at the helpline we're, we're independent, so we're not attached to the government. I think that helps. We're also confidential, so you know, um, as in Toby's case study, individuals can re remain anonymous uh, and we can send sanitised referrals. So uh, we're not identifying the potential victim that's reported the situation. Um, we've got access to interpreters, so potential victims are able to speak to us in their preferred language. I think that helps. And um, most importantly, we're victim centred. So providing an individual isn't a minor or and they're not at immediate risk of harm will be led by them and at their pace. So I think a combination of those factors um, help potential victims to self-report to the helpline. Fabulous, thank you, Tash. Um, a couple of other questions. Do you estimate that the increase in calls is down to increased numbers of people experiencing the abuse exploitation or because of better awareness of support? That's from Bella. Um, I think this is always an interesting one and it's a little bit chicken and egg. So we never really know because we never genuinely had a baseline. Um, the increasing calls, I think, um, you know, quite often is as a, a better understanding of the issue, maybe not necessarily more of it happening, um, but we can never be totally sure. All we can do is uh, look at our data, look at what information we're getting in and look at any um, associated activity that's occurring at that stage. And we have been doing some work to um, better utilise our data to provide um, you know, more technology, looking at machine learning and AI in terms of how we can, can look at the impact of campaigns, impact of external factors on the helpline and, and whether we can um, look at the, the, the way in which that affects what we see on the helpline. Um, so it's a really good question, but it's not something that we've got a very kind of um, you know clear answer on. Um, it's just one of those things that we think that actually um, education and awareness is really supporting people um, contacting. And I think that just comes into Jenny's other question around uh, Romania being the highest in terms of self-reporting. For me, I think that's really about uh, we've got quite um, a prevalent diaspora community within the UK. I think there's known um, understanding of the, the issue of labour abuse and how people are being treated and the um, number is better known within those communities. So we have seen historically more Romanian victims than, than others and also particularly through the national referral mechanism statistics and also policing. But we also see different typologies Policing generally tend to see more, historically we're seeing more sexual exploitation. Now we're seeing a real prevalence of criminal exploitation. And so it's just helpful to have those different approaches and different focuses in terms of understanding what's happening across the UK. Um, a couple of other questions, perhaps we can just get to, um, we've, we've got a minute or so left. Um, so do you have any more granular detail around recruitment, where these ads were placed, types of platforms used, etc.? That's from Robert again. Tash, do you want to take that one? Um, so we, we do in some of our case comments, um, however, it's not in the data model uh, in that level of detail. Fortunately. Yeah, and I, I think all of the, the data, as I've said previously, we don't over egg the pudding in any way, shape or form. So we do capture quite a lot of information, but in many instances, particularly where there's a third party reporting, and this is the importance of having somebody in direct contact with a potential victim or speaking to the potential victim themselves, quite often uh, the data is sporadic, it's it's unknown, and we don't want to make assumptions, um, but we do have granular information and we did provide um, and contributed uh, quite significantly in terms of helpline data to a report that we did with the Home Office looking at um, prevention activities and the types of methods of control and recruitment methods that, that are being used um, across um, a whole cohort of, of individuals. So um, we do have the capability capacity to, 
to do that um in in um you know when when we've got the ability um through funding to to support that so um, we are keen to look more into the detail in terms of the different nationalities the different types of situations that we are reporting um I think we'll have to leave it there. We've got a few others in the chat which we will um, aim to provide answers to. And as we send out a link to the annual assessment report, as well as the presentation deck that we've got here today, then we will um, also provide answers to those questions that haven't been um, been responded to at the moment. Um, so just finally, I think um, without further ado I'd like to say thank you to everybody for presenting today thank you to everybody for turning up and listening to um, the important data but also the view from Toby in terms of the helpline I especially want to thank uh, Natasha for all of her dedication and leadership to getting us to this point for Toby for sharing his experience and, and knowledge and understanding and to the whole helpline data team and helpline teams who really provide that ongoing um, support to those who are most vulnerable, particularly to Nate, Sarah and Roxy within the data team through, um, you know, through their dedication and support. We wouldn't be able to do this. Um, to Paula Falco, Paula Falco, our designer, who provides uh, pro bono support every year to getting us to where we get to and works um, like a Trojan every year. So thank you, Paula. Really do appreciate all your continued support with that. To all of our partners, including businesses, Clear Initiative, A21, statutory agencies, Border Force, uh, Gang Master Labour Abuse Authority, all of the business businesses that we work with who promote the helpline, who are hub members and support the helpline moving forward, as well as our portal members. And finally, to our comms team who do a, a great job of promoting the benefits of the helpline and really securing media traction to raise awareness of this uh, terrible issue. So thank you very much for um, attending today. I really hope you found it insightful. These are unique insights that the helpline can provide to what is um, an egregious uh, situation and um, really hope that you will see the benefits of the work that we do. Um, and please do read the annual assessment because that is um, extremely important. So thank you very much for your time and look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you.